Hello everyone, welcome back. This is episode 3, part 3. We have just made the system where we can both read our assets, our file assets, and get all of the dialogue lines within them, and we've created the system to parse those lines into the three separate sections for speaker data, the dialogue data, and command data as well. It's in its simple form right now, we just have that data as three separate strings, but the parsing is in place and we can actually send this stuff to the dialogue system now to have it show up on screen and get everything looking nice. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video. So let's go ahead and make it where we can send that into our dialogue system, so which means we're going to be opening up that script. Our dialogue system is pretty empty right now. And in good practice, you want to keep things as small as you can. And this dialogue system, with all the features that it's going to be capable of, it's going to be a fairly large script if we run everything inside of itself. You'll notice we separated the dialogue container, even though it's just the elements that are passed into the dialogue system. Just like we made a new class for the dialogue container, we want to make some references to other little systems that the dialogue system will use. And we'll get into a couple of those as we go through the series, but there is one that we're going to be using today, and that will be a conversation handler. All of our dialogue systems, if there is more than one line, then it's going to be treated as a conversation. It doesn't matter if it's just with one speaker, it's still going to be a conversation, because a conversation is only going to consist of more than one line. Well, frankly, one or more lines. It's just going to be a list of lines. And it's all going to be handled by that system. But we'll keep that separate from the dialogue system. So let's go into Unity and create that. So for our dialogue system, we already have a folder called Dialogue. And in here, we've got our dialogue line, and we've got our dialogue parser. As we create more that's going to go into our dialogue lines, such as if we look at it right now, all we have is the speaker, the dialogue, and the commands. Well, we know that we have casting data that we can send to speakers, such as if we are saying someone is going to be speaking as another character or at a different position or with a different layer and expression, we'll want all of that data to be stored in there. So each of these will become their own data type for like speaker data, dialogue data, command data, and all that's going to go in with this as its own little container. So we'll make a subfolder here and we'll call this data containers. And a dialog line is going to be a data container, so we'll throw that in there as well. Our dialog parser can sit outside here, and we'll bring our dialog system inside as well. And we'll do the same thing with our dialog controller. Now inside of here, there are going to be different things that the dialog system uses, such as our conversation handler, and we're going to call these managers. So I'll make a separate folder for our managers. And a manager is anything that is going to handle a specific task for the dialog system. So that way it doesn't have to do everything by itself. So let's go ahead and hop in here, and we'll create a new c -sharp script called the Conversation Manager. Once that's compiled, let's open that up. And of course, what I want to do is I want to make sure that it is in the namespace of dialog. I'm not sure if there's a shortcut key for that in Visual Studio, but uh, I'll figure it out eventually. For now, I'm just going to type it manually each time. I know you can go into Unity and set the, the default template for your classes, but I don't feel like doing that. Not that big of a deal to me. So this conversation manager, we'll go ahead and remove that as a mono behavior. It's not going to be assigned to any objects in the scene. But what we will do is we will come to our dialog system, which is closed out. Let me just close out all of these other tabs. We don't need these open anymore. What we do want open is our dialog system and the testing script for the test part. Well, nah, we'll, uh, we'll make a new one called test conversations or test dialog files actually there we go so we got all three of these opened up this is what we're going to be working with and for our dialog system 
let's go ahead and do just like we did for our dialog container. We're going to say, this is going to be private, conversation manager equals new conversation manager. Now, we want a way of knowing when we are in conversation and when we're not for the dialog system. The dialog system is going to be a class that a lot of different things are going to be using. And a lot of different things are going to try to use the dialog system. And what it needs to do is it needs to be able to keep track of the current conversation that it's in, when that finishes, and like, you know, its progress and everything, because it's going to advance one line at a time. And we don't want to start things when a conversation is already running. So we want to make sure that we know when a conversation is actually running. So let's create a Boolean in the conversation manager that'll tell us that. We'll call this public bool and then is running. And we'll just set that to false. And for our dialogue system, what we'll then say is public bool is running conversation and point that to our conversation manager dot is running. So that way we always know when we're running a conversation and when we're not. In addition to that, we're going to remove start and update here because we don't really need those two. And we're going to use a different function, which will basically be the function for the dialog system. And that's going to be the say command. Whenever we call say, we're going to pass in whatever we want to say on the screen. This could be for characters, narrations, anything that you want to show up inside of your dialog box. So let's make a public void called say. And in here, well, we can have a couple different things we can pass in. I want to make this fairly easy to use, and uh, no matter what kind of data you want to throw in, you want to be able to use the say command. So we're going to be using several different variants of this function. The first one, we might pass in just a regular speaker, as well as some dialogue. So in addition to that, this is what we're really going to be looking for. What our dialogue system is really going to be expecting is going to be a list of things to say. And that's going to be what it can pass into the conversation manager to get the conversation rolling. This is just going to be a list of strings, which we'll be calling our lines. So the next method for say, we will call say, but this time we'll pass in a list of string, and that will be our conversation. And if we get a speaker and we get dialogue, we're just going to format it and throw it into a list to send to the conversation. So we'll make a new list string. And inside of here, we're going to make our own little line with the appropriate format. So the line's going to start with the speaker name that we have. And then inside of quotes, let's escape those quotes. And inside of there, let's stick our dialogue. And then we'll just say list string conversation equals that new list. And we'll pass in say conversation. And we can minimize that. Now, if we already have our conversation and we throw in this list of strings, this is what we'll be pulling directly from those dialog files. So we'll take all of this and we need to send it to our conversation manager. So let's go ahead and remove our start and update here. And let's replace them with a new function called start conversation. And this is going to have our list of strings. And what Start Conversation is going to do is it's going to run itself inside of a coroutine. And as you might imagine, whether this coroutine is running or not is going to determine whether this Boolean is true or not. So in addition to that Boolean, let's make ourselves a private coroutine called process and set it equal to null. And then for public bool is running, we're going to check if process is not equal to null. If it's not null, then we are indeed running. So this I enumerator, this coroutine we're going to be running, let's call it running conversation. Okay, and once we start the conversation, we need to start this coroutine. 
but we'll need to do that on the dialog system. So we'll be just be sending it to the dialog system for it to run, but we'll keep track of everything within this conversation manager, including all of the logic that needs to happen, just so we keep our code nice and separated and clean. So in the dialog system, we will say conversation manager dot start conversation and provide the conversation we want it to start. And in here, if we are starting it, we need to make sure there's not already one running. So we'll have public void stop conversation. And then if is running, or if not is running, we'll return nothing. Otherwise, if it is, we'll say we want an ins a reference to our dialog system because that's going to run our coroutines. So up top, we'll go ahead and say private dialog system and call this the dialog system and point that to the dialog system dot instance. We're only going to have one in the scene at any given time. And so if we are running, then we want to say dialog system dot stop coroutine and stop our process. And then make sure that our process is null. So that way we don't think we're still running. If we go to start the conversation, well, depending on your use case, maybe you don't want to stop it. But for me, I will want to stop anything if I'm trying to start a new one. And I think that would work better for most people anyway. And once we have that, now we need to start it. So we'll say process equals dialog system dot start coroutine. And we'll pass in running conversation. And we want to send it the conversation that we're trying to pass in. So let's copy this parameter. Paste it in here and then just throw in the conversation. And there we go, now we're starting our coroutine. So what exactly are we going to do in here? Well, first of all, let's go to our testing dialog files and we can open up that, uh, that one script we had previously which read the lines of the file because we're going to basically do the same thing here. And that was the test parsing script. So we'll take this list of lines and I'm actually going to just copy that and go to test dialog files here and paste this here and send file to the dialog system. I'll just say start conversation. All right. So when we start the conversation, we're going to read the text asset that we want to load up and then we're not going to do anything with those lines. We're going to remove that, but we're going to send them to the dialog system. So dialog system dot instance dot dot say, and we're going to say every line that we have pulled from that file. So what are we going to do with these lines when we have them? We need to convert them into those dialog line formats, and then we need to feed them to the text architect. So we could start by looping through every single line. So for int i equals zero, while i is less than conversation dot length i plus plus. I don't know where that came from. That's supposed to be, oh, it's supposed to be count. It's a list. Yeah, I'm dumb. All right, so it's a, if it's a list, it's count. If it's an array, it's length. Uh, sometimes I just get those mixed up. That's what happens when you're running your mouth uh, a million miles a minute. So let's go ahead and convert our first line into the dialog line. So we'll say that our dialog line line equals conversation at our current index, but we need to convert it. And to do that, we need to use our dialog parser dot parse and parse that line. And so we'll get our we'll get our full dialog line, and now we can start sitting stuff. But, of course, we don't want to do that for blank lines, so if conversation i is not equal to string.empty, or actually, if it is equal to string.empty, then we want to skip it and continue. Since we've gotten this, maybe our line has dialog, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just commands. We need to check that. So, let's look. If line 
dot dialog is not equal to nothing. But once we actually get into having different data for our dialog, it's not going to be a string. It's going to be another data type. So let's go into here and make it where we can figure out if we have dialog without actually looking at this string. Because once we make the data type, we're going to have to look inside of that data type at some different values. So it'll be kind of future proofing us. So we'll say public bool has dialog. And we're going to say that that is equal to dialog, not equal to string.empty. Okay, so then if line dot has dialog, then we want to do something. We want to show that dialog. And I'll throw a little header up here for show dialog. And then anything after that point would be to run any commands that we might have. So let's step back in there again and let's see if we have any commands. Public bool has commands is if our commands is not empty. And so if line dot has commands, then we're going to run whatever commands that we had. So if we have the line, we have dialogue, then first thing we want to do is we want to see if we have a speaker. So yeah, one more time. Here we go. So public bool then has speaker. It's not doing autocorrect or autocomplete for me this time. Speaker is not equal to string dot null or string dot uh, empty which actually seeing that maybe it'd be better if we did is null or white space because maybe maybe we'll just have blank lines but it could be just spaces could be just like a bunch of spaces that maybe we didn't get rid of so we don't want to show that either all right cool that's a little better so if we have dialogue then next thing we need to check is if we have a speaker so if line dot has speaker otherwise we don't want to show it but I can see how this might start to get a little cluttered. So why don't we take our speaker information and why don't, why don't actually, why don't we separate all of these into their own little coroutines? So we could say, we could start by making a new I enumerator and say run dialog or let's do line underscore run dialog. And we'll use the dialog line line. And so when we have a coroutine that we call inside of another coroutine, a nice little thing we can do is just say that we want to yield return followed by the name of the coroutine. So yield return line run dialog and we can pass in the line. So it's going to yield until whatever happens in here finishes. And likewise, we could do that for the commands as well. I enumerator line run commands. And then yield return line run commands with the line that we're working on. There, that's a little neater, and we can clearly see what's going on there. So inside of our dialog, let's go ahead and check if we have a speaker. So then, we want to do something if we have a speaker, but we also want to do something if we don't have a speaker. And that would be setting the visibility of the speaker name text on our screen. So in Unity, you can see we have the name box here. And maybe, depending on what your setup is, you might have a separate box set up with your name text inside of it. And you might want that to disappear whenever there's not a speaker talking. So we'll want access to that. But these boxes may not always be the same. They might have little special transitions you might want to do for them. They might have a bunch of different 
logic that you could put on it. It's, it's your project. So we want to have a way that it can access not just the name text, but the actual box that it's attached to, and run some logic for that box to close it out or reveal it, which means we're going to want another script. So we have our dialog inside of dialog containers. Actually, here we have our dialog container. Let's make a name container as well. So we'll make a C sharp script and call a name container. And so the name container is going to be the box that holds the name on screen. And the whole point of this is we want to have our own show and hide functions. That way, if you have special logic you want to run, maybe you want to fade, maybe you want to do some fancy transition when your name shows or hides, then you can do that in here, and it'll be separate from all the other code. So the one thing that we want is we want to make sure that we have, let's do a serialize field, private game object, and we'll call this the root, and then another serialize field, private text mesh pro UGUI. Make sure you include the TM Pro namespace. And this will be the name text. Those are really the only th two things that I need. And so for show, we'll want to reveal the root. So I could say that root.set active is false. I, that was an odd autocomplete there. You'd think for show it would set it to true, but hey, I'm not going to complain too much. Then root.set active to false. That'd be a very simple way of doing it. Also in show, maybe I want to show a particular name. So I could say that name to show and just maybe make that empty so I don't have to provide it. But if name to show is not equal to string.empty, then name text dot text equals name to show. No, we're getting this little error down here because we didn't satisfy our coroutines here. Let's just temporarily yield return null on both of these. That way our other scripts can compile. There, so you'll notice that we have our name container here, but it's expecting a game object, which I don't want. I want this to just be another field that is inside of the dialog container. So there are two things that we can do to fix that. First of all, we can remove mono behavior because it's not going to be on a game object. And then we can add a header attribute called system.serializable and serialize this class. And with that, we now have a field over here for our name container, which needs our name text. So let's go to our root container, add our name text there, but we also need a box for the name text. Now for my scenario, I don't actually have a box for my name text, and nor do I want one. But you might, so go ahead and put your box in there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just set my box to an empty parent. And what this parent is going to be is I'm going to give it a canvas group component. So if I take that down, if I take the alpha, I can fade in and out my name. And so then let me just drag in my name container. There we go. Got access to it all. And so for us to access that, we could access our dialog system and access its container directly, or we could just send a command to the dialog system itself and tell it to hide or show the speaker, depending on the state of the conversation. So for our dialog system, let me make two little functions that will take care of that for us. And these are just going to be pointers. So public void show speaker name, and I'll have a speaker name equals just blank by default and I'm going to point that to our dialog container dot name container dot show along with our speaker name and the same thing public void hide speaker name and I'm going to point that to our dialog container dot name container dot hide there and so for the conversation manager, I can say if line dot has speaker, then dialog system dot show speaker name line dot speaker. 
else dialog system dot hide speaker name. So if we have a speaker for this line, we're going to show it. And if not, we're going to make sure that the name is not visible at all. But let's go ahead and continue on and now get our architect to start building this text. But we don't actually have an architect, do we? We don't. We need to create one. And this is not going to be assigned to our conversation manager. This is going to be assigned to the dialogue system itself. So let's make it over here and say private text architect. Call it our architect. And inside of awake, well, let's make a new void. New private void called initialize. And this is just where we're going to initialize our dialogue system. We'll say bool initialized equals false. Then if we are already initialized, we're going to return. Inside of awake, after we go ahead and make sure if this instance is um, proper or not, then we're going to initialize. We'll do that only if this is a proper instance. And so initialize, just like that. If we're initializing it, then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create ourselves an architect. So we'll say architect equals new text architect. And then we need to pass in the dialog container, dialog text, as the text that the architect is going to use to build on. Okay, we'll minimize that and minimize awake. And now we have ourselves an architect, but it's private. So our conversation manager is not going to have access to it. But if we still want it to have access to it, then we need to give a certain way for it to have access while the architect is still private. So other scripts can't really just go willy nilly accessing that thing and changing whatever they want. We'll add one more thing into initialize, and that's going to be a constructor for our conversation manager. When we create a conversation manager, we'll give it an architect just like we've done for the dialog system, but we're going to give it the same architect. That way they've got the same reference and we're going to be able to access it directly without exposing it to the rest of the scripts. So let's make our constructor public conversation manager and we'll add a text architect architect and then private text architect architect equals null and say this dot architect equals the architect that's been provided which means for our dialogue system that is no longer valid we'll remove that and when we initialize after we create our architect we'll say that conversation manager equals new conversation manager and pass in the architect we just created and now it has a reference to our private architect so just like that we have pretty much securely shared our architect with this one single script. And that is perfect because that's all we need. So now that enables us to go ahead and render out the dialogue on screen. So now build dialogue. So we'll say architect.build and we're going to build the align.dialog. Okay, cool. And while this is running, we want to loop until the architect has finished building and then finish the rest of the line. So we can do that easily just by saying while architect dot is building yield return null. Great. And so once all that's finished, dialog arch the architect's going to finish and then it's going to try to run any commands. We don't have any commands, but what I'll do here is I'll say debug.log line.commands just so we can see the commands that we have and we can know that that's working. Once it finishes, it's going to immediately advance to the next line and that's not really what we want. We want to wait for a minute. Before we get into key presses, we're just gonna keep it simple and all we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for a short amount of time as we move to the next line. So we'll say yield return new wait for seconds and say we're gonna wait for one second 
Okay, so our test dialog files is going to start the conversation. It's going to read it from the text asset and then tell the dialog system to say the lines. The dialog system is then going to receive those lines and it's going to tell the conversation manager to get started. At which point it's going to get started, run all those lines, and then we should see it build to the screen. In order for that to work, let's go ahead and add our testing script. I no longer need these, so I'm going to remove those. And I'm going to make a new one called test dialog files and system conversations. And then through my testing scripts, just go ahead and drag that in there. And now let's cross our fingers and start. Okay, John speaks, hello world. Hello world, croak right back at you. And then the narrator. And it looks like that's it. It ran through each of the lines and we can see that uh, it did indeed parse each line and then we have the line in our conversation manager run commands which printed out all the commands okay so everything works it is building it on screen and setting the name but as you can see narrator is showing up and I don't actually want narrator to show up I want narrator to basically clear out the speaker name and the reason for that, if we have multiple lines from the same character, I don't want to have to specify the same character on each line. For instance, where is it? If we have Ellen, who is saying something on line one, I don't want to have to say Ellen is saying things on every single line. I would much rather just be able to continue with the last speaker and keep going from there as much as I want. Even though we'll eventually add little ways to have multiple lines on one one individual line for a character through segmentation but this is also an option where we can do multiple lines for visibility's sake just make it easier to read and if i just do that without specifying a speaker name then it's going to continue off of that name but if i add narrator i want it to clear out the name so let me add an exception to that uh, that speaker list there. The way this happens is we check if the line has a speaker and then we try to show the speaker name. But instead of that, what I want to do is I want to smartly assign the speaker. Which means I want to evaluate what the speaker actually is. And this will be especially handy once we start using casting data because then we can apply stuff to the speaker as we cast it in. So let's go back to the dialog system here. And instead of going straight to showing the name, let's go ahead and change this into a legitimate standalone function here. But we only want to do this if our speaker name is not equal to narrator. And if I want it to be case insensitive, I'll just say to lower. It's not equal to narrator. Otherwise, if it is, then I instead want to hide the speaker name, just like that. And there we go. When it reaches the last line, because it's the narrator speaking, the name disappears. Now, this is all great, except we're missing a little functionality for our architect. We don't have that double click and triple click feature that we had in our dialogue uh, architect testing script that we established before where when I click the space bar it would make it hurry up so we want to kind of do the same thing here and that means that we don't want to yield and wait while it's building but we want to also monitor for input while we're doing that and we want to keep our input separate from this script we always want to try to separate everything that we can from each script that we're working on if it's not related to the purpose of that script. And input should be separate anyway. We want our own controller for that. So we'll need a way to detect that input without actually listening for the keys. So in our dialog system, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to make it where once the user tries to prompt it to advance to the next line, which will be through our conversation manager, it's going to reach out to the dialog system and execute an event that other scripts can subscribe to. 
And this is something that the conversation manager is going to subscribe to so it can listen for this uh, user prompt. So then a conversation manager can do what it does when, uh, whenever that event is called, which would be to speed up our architect or force complete it or advance to the next line, what have you. So the way we're going to do this is we need to define an event and an event type. And that type is going to be a public delegate. We want to make, make it public because it has to have the same accessibility as the event, which other things will subscribe to, so they'll need it to be public. So a delegate, it will have a void return type. We don't need anything to return from it. And I'm just going to call it a dialog system event with no arguments. So any function that matches this with a void return type with no arguments will be able to subscribe to this event. And we'll call this of an event type and of the dialog system event. We're going to call this uh, event the on user prompt next. Okay, so whenever this is triggered, anything that is subscribed to it is going to do its logic. Okay, so here's how that's going to work. In order to get this to actually trigger, we need to monitor for a key press. And we need to monitor for whether the user clicks on screen or presses something on their keyboard. But we want to keep that logic separate from the dialog system. So instead, we'll have whenever that happens, it'll just call in a, a function on the dialog system which will trigger this event. So that function we'll call public void on user prompt next uppercase this time other one was lowercase this one's uppercase and so we're going to make sure that that event executes so on user prompt next question mark dot invoke we're using a question mark so that way if it's null it's not going to do anything it's not going to trigger any errors but if we do have it then we're going to invoke whatever events are subscribed to it so how do we subscribe to that thing then well here's how we can do it our conversation manager is created and at the same time it assigns the architect we'll also want to subscribe to that event so we need something to pass into it that can be called anytime that event is triggered and so what we want to listen for is something that's going to tell our architect to continue and we can do this with a little boolean so i'll make a private boolean called advance or called user prompt oh, it's a little clearer user prompt we'll set that to false by default and then here we'll define a private void and then on user prompt next just going to give it the same name going to make it a void type Okay, so now, since it returns nothing and it takes no arguments, it is of the same type as the dialog system event. So I can say the dialog system dot on user prompt next, that event, we're going to add our on user prompt next. So that way, whenever it runs, we're going to trigger whatever logic is inside of this function here, which for us would just be user prompt equals true. Okay, there we go. And now let's look at what we can do for our architect. So while the architect is building, we don't just want to yield and return and wait for it to finish, but we want to monitor for that input. So if user prompt, then let's check. If the architect dot hurry up, if it's hurrying, if it's actually not hurrying, then we want architect dot hurry up to equal false. Otherwise, architect dot force complete. Okay, so if we do have the user prompt, then we're going to tell the architect to speed up. And then we will just reset on user prompt equals false or no user prompt equals false. And once again, 
I would actually like to move this into its own coroutine as well, just to make things really nice and neat. So I'll make another one, I enumerator, and then, and I'll call this build dialog. And this will pass in a string for the dialog that I want to build. And so I'll take that, I'll cut that, I'll yield return for the duration of build dialog with the line dot dialog as what I want to be built. Inside of here, I'll go ahead and paste that. So architect.build dialog, and then we're going to wait for this to complete. And we can see that everything is still working, so we're good to go from here. So all we need now is a way to trigger this event. The only thing we're missing is we're waiting on something to trigger this function right here, which we can call on key presses or when we hit the screen. So let's go ahead and take care of that right now. Let's go ahead and start a little player input controller. So we'll come into core and then I'm going to make a separate folder for user controls make a C sharp script for player input manager. Okay, so our player input manager is going to handle input. And right now we're just using the legacy system, but we will switch this out for the new Unity input system later on. So let's make a separate function to actually call the dialog system next. Public void prompt advance. And if we prompt the system to advance, we're going to reach out. Let's make sure we uh, encapsulate this into the namespace of dialog. And then we want to call the dialog system dot instance dot on user prompt next whenever we do that now why do we stick it in here because we're going to call it from two separate places we're going to call it on key press so if input dot get key down key code dot space or input dot get key down key code dot return so if i do the space key or the enter key then i want to prompt the system to advance. Also inside of the UI, I want a way to click the screen and have that advance it as well. So we'll reach out to that function there. We could monitor for the left mouse click, but if we're hovering over certain buttons, then even if we click those buttons, it would trigger that event as well. And we may not necessarily want that. I know I don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my controls here and we have, what is this button? What is that? I have no idea what that is. I'm just going to uh, leave that off because I got all my buttons here. Yeah, I'm just removing that. Okay, and I'm going to add a UI. And I'm going to make, well, I guess I could have kept that. <laughs> I'm going to make a button. <laughs> and this one is going to be expanded to fill the entire screen. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the text. And I'm going to set the transparency of the image all the way down so it's invisible. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to position this behind my panel of buttons so that way it can't be triggered when I'm clicking on these. And inside of this button, if I come to the button component, on this on click event field here, I'm going to add a new action. And so I can specify my uh, player input, but I don't have that yet. So inside of managers, let's create another empty and make a player input manager. And so I will put the script on that. There we go. And for our button, I'll simply link the player input manager and then reference that on prompt advance function there. Okay, so let's see what this looks like. Let's do one more thing. Let's go back to the conversation manager. And when we're here, the architect is going to build the dialogue 
and it's going to then return it back to the run dialog. So the dialog has been built at this point, but now we're going to be waiting for the user to prompt it to move to the next line because we don't want that to happen automatically. So we want to wait for user input. And let's make a new coroutine just for that. Numerator, wait for user input. Okay, and then we will say yield return new wait for in or no, yield return wait for user input and we'll wait for the input before we continue on so we can go ahead and remove that one second delay there because we're going to be just waiting on ourselves here so inside of wait for user input what we're going to be doing is while not user prompt yield return null otherwise user prompt equals false and then we return okay cool so we wait for the dialog to build we can prompt it to hurry up and force complete and then we wait for ourselves to prompt it to move to the next line in theory all of this should work but let's go ahead and take this opportunity to go back into unity and make sure that it does Okay, so our first line renders out, and you can see it's not doing anything. Then I hit my space key, and it moves on to the next one. I should have a button here, so if I click the button, then that also moves it to the next line. Uh, let's try that one more time, because I don't think that my force complete and my hurry up was working. Nope, it sure is not. So, let's see why that's not working. You know, sometimes... You just need to slow down and look at what you're doing. <laughs> so if our architect is not hurrying up, then make sure it stays that way. No, we want to make sure that that does hurry up. Okay, let's see. There we go. And it hurries it up. And there. Okay, nice. I think that was a force complete. I'd like to make that line a little longer just to verify. Enough, it hurries it up and also forces it to complete on double click. Great. So, looks like everything is working now. So, we now have it where we are able to read from our dialog files and throw everything up on screen and get it rolling inside of our architect. So, I'm going to end the video off here. Looks like we covered everything that I wanted to cover this week. We've got our file system working. It's reading our files. We've got our dialog parsing for the most part completed. Just not with the finer details yet, but we'll get there. And we've also got everything rolling from the dialog files straight to our screen. So, I think this is a good stopping point. In the next video, we'll work on finishing up the parsing and then we'll get into characters and the, the finer functions of the visual novel and start bringing things to life on the screen. All right. Hope everyone enjoys. Hope you all have a wonderful week, and I will see you next week.